So good morning. <laughs> so about 20 years ago, I was working in corporate research and development at 3M. It was one of my first jobs out of graduate school, and I was hired about the same time as four other PhDs. Working in corporate R&D was very exciting. We got to work on a lot of new technologies and emerging products coming out of um, 3M Center. But occasionally, we would get pulled into what's known as a production problem. And that's when a product that 3M was currently selling would fail in the field. And the people in the field had run out of ideas or ways to figure out what had gone wrong. So I was on one of these production problems once. And I was working with a lot of my friends. And we all had our own expertise, you know, technologies or techniques that we had learned in graduate school and that we were experts in. And we had these really fancy equipment, you know, million dollar instruments that could visualize things down to an atom. And we were all getting all this data and we just couldn't figure out what was going on. So like we usually did when we got stumped is we, went, we turned to Ray. And Ray was the staff scientist in our division and very much a mentor to many of the young scientists in our group. So I remember we went up to Ray's lab and he listened to what we have done, looked at our data. He sort of walked over, he pulled a book down, he looked something up, and he went over to his bench and he pulled some chemicals together, mixed some solutions, and took an eyedropper and put a drop on the product and he solved it. So, so, what, so it really, uh, that always stuck with me, because what Ray taught me, and he, he really liked all the PhDs, but he had a thing, because he himself didn't have a PhD. He had worked his way up at DuPont before he moved over to the 3M, and one of the things Ray taught us is that a lot of times it's the simple things that help you solve problems, and it's being creative, that a lot of being a good scientist isn't about what you've learned or about what you're an expert in, but it's more um, a way that you approach problem solving and use creativity and curiosity to, to really listen and figure out what's really going on. And so here I am 20 years later, and now I run my own company, and shown here, these are the um, personnel and the people that work with me at Sierra Helix. We have a materials research company up in Orono, and many of my employees are, are Mainers. In fact, I, just a, a little shout out, of my, one of my chief inventors and um, project scientists went to Main School of Science and Math, and one of my employees went to John Baffs, and the other one is from Bucksport High. So we've, we've done a good job of sort of you know, pulling in some of the things you've heard before, like these innovative people that are, have sort of born and raised here in Maine. And we work together in this company inventing a new type of ceramic filtration product. So it's a materials science company. And we've developed a new ceramic material which makes a highly efficient filter. And the way we invented this product was it was about five years ago. And my co-founder, Carl, and I were talking. And I said, Carl, because he is a biophysicist, I said, I'd really like you to go down to the Materials Research Society meeting down in Boston. And he, I remember he looked at me and he said, well, I'm the one who's not the material scientist, so why would I go to the meeting? And I said, well, because I think biology is a really hot new area in materials. People are always turning to nature to look for ideas and inspiration to develop new materials. And I think you can learn a lot about what's going on, sort of the cutting edge of material science. So Carl went down to Boston. And when he returned, he sort of said two things. One is that the engineers down there really didn't understand DNA. He'd sat through a bunch of talks of engineering new products with DNA. And his, He's a little bit dubious about some of their approaches. And two, he had had an idea. And so Carl's idea was we were sitting here trying to follow some recipes to make these ceramic particles that were going into the product we were developing. And we were following standard recipes where you take um, organic molecules and you use them to template the ceramics or form certain structures in the ceramics. And it occurred to him that DNA is just another organic molecule. And so what Carl's insight was is he had spent 20 years working with DNA and manipulating it and doing biotechnology. And so to him, DNA wasn't just a genetic material. It was also what they call a generic material. It had a shape and properties all of its own. And so Carl's, he was really just curious. He didn't have any specific problem he was trying to solve. He just wanted to see what would happen if we made some of these same materials and used DNA instead of an organic, another organic molecule. So he went off in the lab and he started playing around and he had some questions like, what would this look like? What would the resulting material look like? How small would the holes be? And of course, my, my input to the whole process was what, you know, and what you, how useful will it be? Is there a product we can make out of this? Because we are, to all intents and purposes, hopefully at some day being a for-profit company. And so what we've come up with is a recipe that we've developed where we can take DNA and we can mix it in with the ceramic material and while it's still in a gel phase. And so we manipulate the DNA before we mix it in so that it can interact with the ceramic in a way where it's spread out through the material. We then apply heat, which hardens the ceramic and removes the DNA all in one step. 
And the result is a ceramic material with holes less than a nanometer that are continuous through the material. We can then apply that ceramic material as a coating to the inner surface of commercial ceramic filter tubes. And the result is a ceramic filter that filters at 10 times higher purity than any commercial ceramic filter on the market. And so it turns out that uh, this makes it, because we have the DNA channels that are very continuous, it's a very highly efficient, low energy consuming filter made out of a ceramic material. And it turns out this has a lot of value in today's world. So one of the things is to first sort of orient you is within this filtration spectrum, we're called nanofiltration. So our filter filters so finely, they can actually remove things 100 times smaller than a virus from water. And so this is the area where you're actually filtering at the molecular level. So we can remove things that are dissolved in water. So any sort of contaminant that's actually physically dissolved can be removed by our filter. And this is both a physical and a chemical interaction process. So we separate things using our filter. The second is since our filter is made out of ceramic, it can operate in conditions that other filters don't operate. 70% of the world's filters are made out of plastic. And there's a lot of conditions that plastic's not compatible with. Where, and, so for, and that's one of the examples I'll share with you today. So one of the first problems we approached and looked at solving with our filter is something that's faced by the renewable biofuels industry. And that's a growing industry here in Maine. So you've heard some talk before about different resources that Maine has to address growing problems of limited energy resources. Well, biofuels look at a couple different limited resources. As the world is developing, as the population is growing, we're seeing an increased strain in both energy and water usage. And a lot of times these resources are interconnected in competition because it takes energy to purify water and it takes actually a lot of fresh water to create power and electricity. And so they're intertwined. This is known as the energy water nexus. So technologies like ours, any technology that can improve energy efficiency or can, that can treat water in a more energy efficient manner can help make this nexus less severe and can actually help you solve one problem without making the other one worse. And so the problem we looked at initially was people in Maine are trying to figure out ways to use one of our resources, which is our Maine woods. Right now, we harvest a lot of trees, which are a renewable resource, and we convert them to pulp and paper. And so in that industry, people have looked at, well, a lot of the pulp and paper that doesn't get converted to make paper out of, we burn. So a lot of, there's a lot of waste in that process, and what they do is they take that waste material and they burn it. And so there's an industry growing that's trying to look at how can we take those materials and actually convert it to something useful in it, you know, for the profit of making a value-added profit product out of it, and also just to be, have better sort of conservation and more sustainable practices. And so within this industry, you try and take the parts of the wood that were waste, and you break them down, and you extract the sugars. And the sugars can then be converted to a whole range of other products. They can be converted to fuels, like biofuels, and other types of starting materials. But the very first step is a challenging one, because when they break the, the wood components down to extract the sugars, it's a very acidic solution. They initially tried filtering out the sugars, but the filter actually dissolved. So we approached them about piloting our membrane in this process. And they were very happy to look at a filtration process, because at that time, the only way they had to concentrate the sugars was through evaporation. And that's a thermal process, uses a lot of energy. So we did a pilot study with our membrane. And first thing is, you know, it didn't dissolve. And the second, we were able to extract the sugars and actually reduce the energy consumption by more than 95%. So this is an example of a really small change or a really small feature having a large impact. So I just wanted to bring to your attention is that the key things that I've learned in doing this product and this company and this technology development is that it's not always the expertise that you have when you start that can lead you to the answer. In fact, this technology that we developed, we, we currently hold three patents on it. And in the course of defending our patents, we went out and we researched a lot of the literature. And we actually found articles in the literature that talked about DNA and materials research. And one of the articles talked, said that you could not use DNA to do ceramics technology because the two materials were incompatible. So we were, I remember we were reading that article and we were thinking, well, I guess we're glad we didn't read this before we started three years ago. So, um, and that kind of brings, like, that's what material science is all about. It's a very much an interdisciplinary process. 
And so all of us bring a different skill set to the table. We have a, an engineer physicist, we have a biotechnologist, and we have chemists and chemical engineers. And we all work together, and we all bring a different skill set to the table. And the most critical thing that we bring is this whole problem solving. So if you've ever wondered what it's like to work in a company as a scientist, a lot of what we do every day is, is very similar to what I did when I was working with Ray at 3M, is we come together and we have problems. We didn't have a recipe to develop this membrane. We had to invent the recipe. So it's very different than in class where, you know, I think if I had been, when I was in high school, if someone said I'd be a chemist, I would have laughed because I wasn't that great at chemistry in high school. I didn't really enjoy the class that much. I just sort of took the class. I was actually won the English award in high school. But I think what I found as I went on in science that it was really the problem solving piece of it that I enjoyed the most. So when we get together, we solve problems. We get, we're presented with this problem, okay, we can get the DNA in the ceramic, but we can't get it to harden up without cracking. You know, what do we do? And so a lot of being a scientist in a working laboratory is much like the previous speaker was talking about. It's, it's very open-ended, and you're learning all the time. We had to change the way we did the ceramic processing, and it's different than everything that's out there in the ceramics textbooks. We would find once in a while an article or something that we could read that would direct us to some more information, but a lot of what we've done, we've had to invent ourselves. And so the key to being a good scientist is, is to have skills, but the most important thing is to have curiosity. And like many of the other speakers have, have talked before, is to really believe that you can get there. So we believe that we could create this. And there are many times over the last three and a half years where it looked like it wasn't going to work. But what keeps us going is sort of that confidence, that, and the confidence that we give each other, that if we work harder and if we you know, try one more experiment or change one more thing, that we'll get there in the end. So I'd just like to leave you with that, and thank you for your attention.